terrestrial microbiology today. So the three questions we're going to try to answer, and um, <clears throat> I hope you all feel comfortable with by the end of the, the this part of the lecture is what makes soil so diverse, and what are the environmental factors that affect soil microbes? Which major roles or ecological processes are microbes responsible for in soils? And how do plants affect microbial communities in the soil? And so terrestrial systems are um, sort of this mixed bag of plants and animals and everything on this planet, whether it lives in the ocean, whether it lives on the land, has an associated microbiome. Um, but for us, we're going to focus simply on the microbes that are associated with soils themselves, like sort of ignoring um, host associated and, and we'll dive a little bit into plants, but mostly just focusing on directly the soil itself. Um, and so soil is sort of this interesting ecosystem and it's the harbors the greatest microbial diversity in abundance, abundance of all terrestrial systems and the sort of globally as well. Um, the soil microbes are affected by numerous factors. Um, they're affected by plants, animals, they're affected by weather, climate, anything you can name, these soil microbes are affected by. And more importantly, the soil microbes are super duper important. And as you all know, I think everything is cool in microbiology, but they are particularly cool. Um, these soil microbes provide basically everything um, <clears throat> that is important to us. So we're gonna sort of dive into this. We're gonna start big and we're gonna think uh, of soils at a larger spatial scale. And so um, what we have here is many different types of terrestrial biomes. So we're hinting from tundra, the very cold, to tropical rainforest being the very warm. And this is a, I think this is a really helpful graph because it sort of depicts how much rain each gets um, as a function of what is the annual temperature. And what you notice is there's a pretty strong correlation between how cold you are and how little rain you get and how warm you are and how much rain you get. But, um, <clears throat> All these different biomes have very different vegetation, and all these different vegetation types are strictly delineated by how much rainfall they get, as well as the medium temperature during the year. Um, every biome, as you probably all know, has very different organisms, both plants and animals alike. So tropical rainforests have very different organisms living in it than, say, a boreal forest or a temperate season, seasonal forest, which we have here in Massachusetts. Uh, but the same biome can occur um, multiple places over the planet. So like, for instance, boreal and temperate forests occur here, they occur in Europe, they occur in Russia, they occur in the uh, Southern Hemisphere. So they can sort of um, occur in multiple different places. But the key factor is, is they're delineated by their temperature as well as their climate. And so this is sort of how these biomes break apart globally. Um, <clears throat> you'll notice that um, even a, a sort of very diverse landscape like the United States has a pretty um, diverse mixture of things, um, you know, ranging from steppes to uh, forests to savannas and so on and so forth. So it's, um, but what you notice, they sort of fall into bands, both um, vertically and as well as horizontally during these systems. Um, <clears throat> Um, unsurprisingly, uh, you, and I think this is pretty intuitive from what we know about microbes at this point, um, is that these different biomes have di very different microbial communities. And so if you remember back to our, um, <clears throat> our, our talk about microbial methods, this is a principal coordinates analysis. So the closer two points are on this graph, the more similar the microbial communities, and these are colored by different habitats. And this is a graph is generated by looking at the 16S ribosomal RNA genes. So for those of you that don't remember, uh, 16S ribosomal RNA gene is a gene that every bacteria has. So we use it as a way to identify and catalog microbial communities in different locations. But the big sort of takeaway from this graph is we see all the reds clustering, browns crust clustering, and then there's sort of this mismatch of tropical and temperate forests. Um, and so what this really tells us that different biomes harbor very different microbial communities, and the more similar the biomes are, um, despite of how far apart they are, harbor very similar microbes. So, for instance, we can look at these temperate forests here, and they're all very similar, but they are very distinct from cold deserts and hot deserts. And that makes sense because of how different the environmental uh, conditions are within these biomes. Um, and we can look at this just sort of just at a different way. <clears throat> Um, looking at the relative abundance of a bunch of different bacterial groups here. And it, what you notice is obviously move from woody cover as a percentage, so zero to 100% woody cover from a grassland down to a woodland. You'll notice is that the microbial communities, who is there? So, you know, here we're seeing 
um, very large amounts of actinobacteria um, consistently throughout, but you're seeing different communities change. And you're seeing the same thing here for bacteria as well as for fungi. So um, very different microbial communities depending on where you are. And we can just sort of look at this at a sort of a holistic table level. Uh, I don't really want you to take away very much from this, but different habitats, desert, hot desert, forest. This basically goes with the very first graph I showed you. And you'll notice is that different, all the, the relative abundance of all these different microbial communities changes depending on where you are. But within a given biome, they're pretty similar. Um, <clears throat> But ultimately, how do we can ask the question is, how do environmental communities influence uh, these community structure? And this is actually a pretty key question in microbial diversity um, and ecology as a whole, simply because we don't quite know yet. It's sort of this thing that people can ask this question in multiple different systems, and we get slightly different answers. And this is not uh, sort of a failure of science. This is more of a, wow, this is a really complex system. And soils are really, really difficult to understand. And that's why they say the only the, uh, the, the uh, crazy people, such as your professor, uh, go into this field. But uh, there is a lot of factors that go into um, leading into diversity. And so we're going to dive into sort of how, the how and why behind this. And so soils, um, they, as, we've, as I mentioned, have very high microbial diversity, and this stems from their complexity. And you don't really, people don't really think about soils holistically. They just think, oh, here's some dirt, here's what it is. But uh, soils are a combination of many different minerals, and each of these minerals has its own chemical composition and makeup. Um, and so we can look at a, any given type of soil, whether... Um, so this is just what we call a ternary plant. As you, it's, you don't really need to understand, but just... Just the, the, the sort of the key features here are there's different types of soil and it's all dependent on how much clay, silt, and sand you have. So if you're very clay, you have a lot of, uh, if you have a lot of clay on this axis, you are clay. If you have very little clay and a lot of sand, you are sand. And if you have a lot of silt and very low clay and very low sand, you are silt. So, <clears throat> But each of these different um, classifications for soil has very different composition chemically. It has also has very different size of particles. Sand is the biggest, silt is sort of in between, and clay is very small. The size of these particles is really, really important for understanding how much water they will hold. Um, so for instance, um, <clears throat> Um, when you have smaller particles, this leads to less pore space in between, which means less water. Um, so clay, clayey soils will tend to trap uh, water better than sandy soils. I'm sure you all know this from the beach. If you've ever been, you know, you put pour water into your in, on sand, and the and the water just basically dissipates almost instantly because sand has a very poor capacity to hold water. Um, but ultimately, the size of this pore space, so the bigger pores you have, the more water you can hold, also also affects how much oxygen can diffuse into these soils. And so you can imagine that if you have a very sandy soil, which has very very um, easy penetration of oxygen, these soils will be much more oxygenated than, say, clay will be. Um, in addition, the amount of carbon um, will differ very, it will differ wildly. Um, and remember, microbes always need to eat. Um, they all need to eat, they need food, they need nitrogen. And so all these sort of factors um, come together to um, influence how these microbes can live in these soils. And then finally, uh, I would also notice is that there's a great deal of uh, patchiness that you find within soil. And so even within, say, if you go outside of your house, um, even on the sidewalk, you grab a bunch of that soil, um, even in that, say, handful of soil that you get, there's a huge degree of patchiness where you have spots that are more clayey than others, more sandy than others, and sort of anything in between. Um, and, but as I mentioned, uh, the soils are extremely complex. And so the, the soil aggregates have many, many different particles. Um, and all these different particles have very different chemistry. And remember that microbes are pretty much just always susceptible to the chemistry of the environment. And the chemistry of the environment really dictates whether or not a microbe can grow and live there. Um, but what you notice here <clears throat> in these electron micrographs of soil, and so these, you know, you're looking at these, these bars are, you know, 136 microns, 300 microns, 15 microns. So very, very small scale. What you notice is that even on this one grain of soil spread across all these, pain, these panes here, 
They have very, very, very heterogeneous, very, very, um, not, they're not smooth. They have a lot of different crevices, cracks. And so you can imagine this creates an enormous amount of patchiness, makes this environment incredibly heterogeneous. Um, and just so, just to put this in perspective, if you have, say, like a, a rubber ball, this is very homogeneous because that rubber ball is almost uniform around. But soils are very, very much heterogeneous as a whole. And ultimately, how much, um, uh, how heterogeneous this provides more surface space. And the more surface space you have, the more what we call niche spaces. And when we think about what a niche is, it's simply just different environmental conditions that microbes can survive in. And so all of this, these factors that we've been going through, all this patchiness, this heterogeneous, all these available niche spaces and holes and pores and all this stuff, all contribute to very high abundances of microbes and very high diversities of microbes. Because you can imagine if we just look at this very small scale, that this environment here is gonna be very different from living here or here or here or anywhere on this. So even with one, a single soil particle, there could potentially be hundreds or thousands of different habitats. And all these habitats can harbor different microbes. And so all these different factors about microbes affect environmental conditions. So we're gonna walk through a few of these important things that are affected by these conditions in soil. So the first is water. And so the basic definition of water is aridity. So ar aridity is simply how dry a place is. If it is very, if it has a high degree of aridity, um, essentially <clears throat> it means it's very dry, has very low aridity, means it's very wet. And so this is the aridity index. Um, it's a combination of part uh, precipitation as well as evapotranspiration. So evapotranspiration is simply when water evaporates off the ground and goes back into the ground. And so when we're thinking about the aridity index, smaller numbers equals a drier place and higher numbers means a wetter place. <clears throat> And so what we can do is we can look at the diversity of bacteria present with higher numbers being more diverse bacteria and the abundance, so the amount of, um, uh, of bacteria present per gram of soil. And what you'll notice is as the aridity index increases, so as we're getting wetter for both bacteria and fungi, diversity does decrease. And as we go, um, <clears throat> as again, as we get wetter and wetter, the abundance of bacteria does decrease slightly. And so the increasing aridity of the soil um, reduces overall microbial diversity and abundance. And this might seem sort of counterintuitive here. Um, you might, you, you, I guess you might imagine that, you know, if you go into this, the wetter places, the more microbes they're gonna have, right? A tropical rainforest must have more microbes or much, must have a greater diversity of microbes than say a dry place. But the fact of the matter is, <clears throat> drier places have much, much more um, sort of, uh, different chemistry and they have much more patchiness than wetter, wetter places. Wetter places typically tend to be much more homogeneous, much more similar at smaller as well as larger spatial scales. So sort of counterintuitive, but um, this is the way things ultimately shake out. Um, next up, we can actually look at or we can look at carbon because this is again affected by that patchiness. Uh, remember, carbon is is basically food, right, and it supplies the fuel as well as the nutrients for these microbes. Um, as the availability of carbon increases, so does the abundance and diversity of microbes. So this is soil, soil organic carbon on the x-axis. It says a percentage. So if you took a gram of soil and you weighed it and you determined how much carbon was there, that's what we're talking about as a percentage. So in the case here, four percent is if I took a gram of carbon, um, you know, four percent of that of that gram. I'm sorry, if I took a gram of soil, and four percent of that soil would be organic carbon at four percent. Um, in addition, we have um, <clears throat> the diversity again on the on the top, and the abundance on the y on the bottom here for bacteria and fungi. And what you'll notice is that. Um, we're going, as we increase the amount of carbon, AKA the amount of food available, we're increasing the amount of microbes present as well as the diversity of microbes. And I think this is pretty intuitive. More food means you can support much more microbes. Um, <clears throat> I will also note, um, this is um, very, very low amounts of carbon. This is more like deserts. Um, um, and, and so this is very, very low amounts of carbon. The carbon, say, that's in the soil outside your, your house or your apartment has much, much higher percentage, about 15 to 20. Um, most coastal systems have 30% carbon, just as a note. So this is very, very low carbon, but it certainly is present. Um, and I just one other sort of note about carbon, um, in addition to sort of abundance and, and sort of whole metrics of microbial abundance and diversity, um, 
Not all microbes respond positively to an increase in carbon. Not all microbes respond the same. And so what we can do is look at the percentage of carbon again on the x-axis here. And then we compare that to the abundance of different groups of microbes. And so as we'll talk about briefly, some of these are the, the absolute most important groups of microbes found in soil. So the protobac proteo proteobacteria here on the left, um, you, you've definitely never heard of these, but many of the bacteria that we've been working with in lab um, do fall into this group. So Pseudomonas, E. coli, they fall into this proteobacteria group. Um, and then we have acetobacteria, chloroflexi, and Veruca microbia. Again, we'll talk about those in a few slides. But what you'll notice is that all these different microbes respond differently. So the acetobacteria increase in their abundance with more carbon, chloroflexi decrease, um, Veruca microbia sort of have this little asymptote, um, whereas the, the delta proteobacteria here and the beta proteobacteria here, they have no relationship. And interestingly enough, the alpha proteobacteria actually decrease in their abundance. And I, I just I will just note that this decrease in the abundance of chloroflexi is actually because they're they are autotrophic, so more carbon is actually bad for them. So, um, so next up is thinking about soils is plants. Simply because you can't you pretty much can't go anywhere, you know, in the sort of in on the planet and and in any terrestrial system and there not be plants. Um, <clears throat> and so plants. Um, uh, very much like humans actually are sort of master manipulators of soil. Plants will drastically modify the conditions around their roots. Um, and they do this through this process of se secreting what are called exudates. And exudates are simply just compounds. They're typically organic carbon-based compounds that they secrete into the soil around them to potentially attract microbes. Um, plant roots themselves receive between 30 to 60% of the net photosynthesized carbon. So when a plant is photosynthesizing above ground, it sends a sizable chunk, again, 30 to 60% down into the roots. And uh, what does make it down to the roots of that 30 to 60%, 40 to 90% actually physically enters the soil. And so these, these plants are physically taking what they're photosynthesizing and pumping it directly into the soil. And what they're pumping in includes a wide variety of things, including sugars, polysaccharides, amino acids, and enzymes. Um, and these exudates as a whole can account for up to 40% of the carbon in the roots. And they do provide numerous benefits to the plant and the microorganisms in the rhizosphere. And so the rhizosphere is just sort of this narrow band of soil that does surround plant roots. It's extremely important for soil health. It's also extremely important for how plants function. Um, if we had more time in this class, we would talk pretty in-depthly about the rhizosphere because it's a really fascinating area of microbiology and it's really important to agriculture as a whole. But just to note, if you're interested in this, um, it's a really interesting um, sort of um, thing to dive into. In addition to carbon, uh, plants will also shuttle oxygen below the surface. Um, for instance, in, in, in coastal systems where there's lots and lots of um, seawater bathing, they will shuttle down um, <clears throat> pump oxygen down into the roots to help sort of dissipate some of these toxic compounds that will, uh, will essentially um, occur at plant roots to help them better themselves. But ultimately, the, the sort of the way plant roots function is the, sort of this direct relationship between bacteria and the plants as a whole, because the plants are providing things for the bacteria, and the bacteria are in turn providing things for the plants. And so you can think of sort of the things that colonize a plant as being very, very similar to those that are, say, um, living on in your body. There's sort of this crosstalk between plant um, and host and the microbes around them. Um, but as I mentioned, the, there's, there, the plant-associated microbes have a lot of sort of uh, important roles. There's a few different sort of key zones we want to think about here. Uh, the first is the rhizosphere. This is the soil directly influenced by the plant roots. We have the phylosphere, which is um, sort of this above ground, the leafy proportion of the plant. And then we have the rhizoplane, which is directly on the plant root itself, itself no soil involved. <clears throat> and so for instance, um, the, the plants will dramatically um, alter the soil conditions, thus recruiting different microbes that live on the rhizosphere. And so just as a, um, just as a, uh, a, a sort of an example of this, uh, this, is some, this is just a figure from some work that I did um, when I was a graduate student. 
And so this is a, a plant called Phragmites australis. And so this is an invasive wetland and marsh plant. You all have seen it in one shape or form. It, you know, it, it's, it's pretty much everywhere. It's slightly wet. But there's three different lineages of these plants. There's the native ones that we find regularly in Massachusetts, the uh, gulf ones that we find down in the um, Gulf of Mexico, and then we have introduced or invasive plants, which we, are, which we know is from Europe. And what you'll notice is that they have very different microbial communities. Um, this, and they could even be growing, say, right next to each other. But because their root chemistry, their rhizosphere is so different, they recruit different microbial communities. And they also have very different active microbial communities as well. And we can just sort of look at sort of the dramatic effect um, of how plants affect soil. And so this is some uh, also from uh, some pictures from when I was a graduate student. Uh, these are sediment cores. Um, and what you can see that this is an unvegetated spot where you see almost no plant roots. And this is a vegetated spot where it is chock full of plant roots. So qualitatively, we can see how dramatically plants can affect the soil around them. And if they can affect them just sort of qualitatively at this level, you know that they're having an effect um, in terms of the chemistry, the carbon, and everything else associated with the soil. So as I mentioned, there are a number of key taxa um, that we find in soils, and there are there's basically every soil community across the planet, whether you're in Antarctica, in Massachusetts, Russia, it doesn't matter. Um, nearly all soil communities are dominated by taxa from five phylums. And these five phylums include the acetobacteria, the actinobacteria, bacteroidetes, proteobacteria, and verruca microbia. So let's talk about a few of these important key soil taxa. And we're gonna start off with one that we've all been working with in the lab. This is the proteobacteria. Um, this is where E. coli falls into. This is where Pseudomonas falls into. This is where a bunch of other microbes that works in the lab fall into. Um, they are, the proteobacteria are the largest and in phenotypically the most diverse phylogenetic lineage as we know of to this date. There are currently uh, 13,000 described species of proteobacteria um, out of the 21,000 described species of bacteria as a whole. Um, just as a fun fact, they were named after the Greek god Proteus, which could assume many different shapes. And I think that's particularly um, a good description of these proteobacteria because they do pretty much everything. They, um, they can live pretty much anywhere on the planet, not just in soil, um, and they can do pretty much any function that you can think of. So they're really, really diverse um, in terms of um, metabolically. Um, that being said, most members of our proteobacteria are facultatively or obligately anaerobic. Um, they're typically chemolithoautotrophic or heterotrophic, with the vast majority of them being heterotrophic. Um, they do have a huge range of metabolic flexibilities, which allows them to uh, basically occupy any soil niche that you can think of. Um, in most local soils, so if you went out, again, outside of your house or your apartment, um, you could go out, scoop up. Um, a handful of soil and about 30% of the bacteria in there would be proteobacteria. Um, those proteobacteria are subdivided into five main classes. Um, so for instance, we've been working pretty heavily with the gamma proteobacteria in the lab. That's where E. coli and Pseudomonas come from. Um, but I would like to talk about Pseudomonas a little bit because it's a really important bacteria, um, not just in terms of clinically, but it, um, it's also really important for soils. And so Pseudomonas is one of the most common bacteria found in soils. It is a member of the gamma proteobacteria, and it is absolutely ubiquitous. No matter where you go and you look at soil, you find Pseudomonas. Um, the most abundant member of this genus of Pseudomonas, which you've worked with in the lab, is Pseudomonas putida. And this is Pseudomonas putida here. You'll notice it's taken upon this nice green color on its media. It's actually a function of <clears throat> the bacteria producing a enzyme called a siderophore that when it binds iron in the media, it, it uh, sort of turns into this greenish color. Um, Pseudomonas is known for its remarkable metabolic flexibility. Um, it has monster genomes for the bacterial world. It has about 5,500 genes, which is much bigger than your average bacteria, which leads it to have much more metabolic flexibility. Um, and these pseudomonads are capable of degrading exotic molecules like plastics, hydrocarbons, um, like uh, industrial solvents. Um, they also have been known to degrade antibiotics. Um, they're really, really useful for this process called bioremediation, where you use life or bacteria to, say, get rid of toxic things in the environment. Um, and these microbes are also responsible for lots of decomposition, 
um, of carbon in the environment. So pseudomonas is a really important. And all this metabolic flexibility makes them particularly su ideally suited to living in soils. Because remember, soils have an enormous amount of, of sort of he uh, uh, diversity in terms of habitat, even with an, on a very small spatial scale. So that's pseudomonas, that's our proteobacteria. Let's talk about actinomycetes. And so this is a major order within the actinobacteria. And uh, actinomyces are really, really cool. They, um, they're these sort of bacteria that don't, they don't really, um, they don't really adhere to many rules that we know about bacteria. Um, and one of the reasons they do that is because they actually grow like a fungus. And so you can look at all these pictures of these colonies. And if you just sort of looked at them, um, sort of at a sort of a facial level, they look like fungus, they look like mold. Um, and it's actually kind of interesting. They produce these things called mycelia. Um, and there's these essentially like these root-like structures that allow them to sort of spread out like a spider web. Um, and, uh, and, it, and so for a long time, we actually thought they were fungi until we sort of started doing um, a lot of different uh, chemical tests to find out, hey, they were actually bacteria. But they are really cool microbes, not just in soil, but if you like uh, soft rind cheeses like camembert and brie, actinomycetes are really important for um, the taste of those uh, those cheeses. Um, they are really abundant in soil as a whole. Um, <clears throat> And they're responsible for much of the digestion of resistant hydrocarbons, such as cellulose from plants. Um, they also can tackle lignin as well. Um, <clears throat> and so they're really useful for composting. They're really useful for this process of bioremediation. Um, there are some sort of notable actinomycetes in terms of clinical, uh, that are of clinical importance. This include corneobacterium. They, they, cause, co uh, they cause tooth plaque as well as diphtheria. And then propioni bacteria, which is uh, responsible for uh, the production of act acne. So those of you that have ever suffered from acne, acne, you can thank propioni bacteria in that jerk. Um, within the actinomyces is a bacteria called a bacterial genus called Streptomyces. Um, these um, are really important for the degradation of organic matter, but they are really important um, for in terms of clinical settings as well, because they produce um, antibiotics. And so streptomycin, neomycin, erythromycin, and tetracycline all come from this genus streptomyces. And so they are really useful at keeping soils um, free from pathogens, both fungal and bacterial alike. So this is a really important group of bacteria in terms of a medical setting, not, not, not in terms of like causing disease, but providing cures for disease. Um, streptomycin and all these antibiotics have saved thousands and millions of lives over the years. So it's really important bacteria. Um, the other thing I will mention is that uh, streptomyces produces geosum. And geosum is a, is a really kind of cool compound. It's what we call a volatile organic compound. Um, and it actually gives soil sort of its soily smell. And so if you've ever been outside after a rainfall, um, the strong scent of sort of uh, that occurs when air falls after sort of a dry weather or when soils disturb that sort of soily smell. That's geosum. That's from these group of microbes. Um, so really cool group of microbes. Um, I suggest if you, if any of the things I said interest you, I would recommend taking a peek into this group of streptomyces. They are a really fascinating group of microbes. So those are sort of the major classes and groups of microbes. What are some of the roles that they perform in these soils? Uh, the first is sort of this, this, this really important role that they play in a food web. And so when we're thinking about microbes in a food web, they, they're either decomposers, they're either symbionts, so living on or within a, a host, and they're also pathogens. And so we can think of sort of a, a, a very simple system where we have, you know, see, we have plants photosynthesizing, they're feeding the, the they're they're feeding the soil, something's eating the plants, and the birds are eating the, what's eating the plants, and there's this whole interconnected web of things that are, are sort of interacting in nature. Um, but microbes do play an important role in terms of how um, these soil food webs function. And so uh, soils are really important. They represent the largest reservoir of organic carbon on the planet. Um, and so this is sort of ties directly back into climate change. Um, they, soils are a really important source, uh, I'm sorry, a really important reservoir to store carbon to prevent it from contributing to man-made climate change. 
But ultimately, soil and the carbon within it has, is subject to degradation and use by the soil microbes. And these soil microbes use a lot. Um, just to put this in perspective, the bacteria and fungi um, found in the soil contribute to approximately 50% of or more of all respiration on the planet as a whole. So just the soil microbes are respiring half of the carbon into the atmosphere than every other organism on the planet combined, which is an absolutely immense amount. Um, that being said, they, they do not emit as much carbon into the atmosphere as we do as humans in terms of combusting of fossil fuels. So um, that being said, they produce about 60 gigatons, which is 10 to the 15 tons of carbon dioxide per year, which is... Um, <clears throat> Absolutely astounding uh, how much they put forth. Um, but they do live, but one of the things that they do do when they are decomposing all these things, they do leave behind compounds that are highly resistant to degradation. These include compounds like humics and phenolics, it doesn't really matter what they are, but they can remain sequestered and store carbon in the soil for a very, very long time. Um, and then uh, in, in terms of moving on for decomposition, um, oops, um, so, so in, uh, sort of keeping on the train of decomposition, in order for organic matter to be taken up to, into a cell, it can't be too large. So bacteria will release these enzymes called hydrolases that can break down very large carbon compounds into much more manageable pieces. These are what we call, these are a class of enzymes called exoenzymes. Um, and exoenzymes do a lot of different things, um, include uh, breaking down large proteins, chitin, which is an important component of uh, insect and crab and uh, ex, uh, exoskeletons, so their harder outer core. They can bake down peptidoglycan, which I'm sure you all know of is by now, uh, cellulose and lipids. And so microbes oftentimes will have many, many different uh, uh, classes of hydrolysis to degrade several types of molecules. Um, and ultimately, um, Bacteria and fungi are also the organisms that break down lignin as well as cellulose, which is, are the two main structural components of wood. Remember, there's a ton of dead wood out there. Um, in terms of decomposition, it does recycle plant nutrients and it does create a soil organic, uh, create soil organic matter. Um, and so there's sort of three sort of broad classes of soils. We have what are called mineral soils, and these are um, sort of what most soils are classified into. We have <clears throat> the mineral soil has, I'm sorry, there's two classes of soil. I, I apologize. We have sort of mineral soil, which has very low carbon content. And then we have organic soil, which is where lots of microbes are doing their thing, has very high organic content. Um, so if we go back to the soil, the soil food web, we'll talk next about symbionts. And so in particular, thinking about um, symbionts in terms of plants. And so plants, as we mentioned, have a very active and an important group of microorganisms that live on in inside and um, directly associated with their roots. And they help plants um, by helping them getting um, more nutrients from the soil around them. It helps enhance the growth and allowing greater access to nutrients. It allows them to help um, bring free nitrogen from the atmosphere, giving these plants a free source of fertilizer. It helps stimulate the growth of plant roots, and it also helps provides a benefit of being sort of this first line of a plant's immune system. Um, in particular, there's a really important group of um, symbiotic <clears throat> microorganisms called mycorrhizal fungi. And so mycorrhiza are these mutualistic associations between a fungus and a plant root, um, essentially where, where carbon flows directly from plant to fungus, in, or in sort of nitrogen and phosphorus flow directly from fungus to plant. So you can see that the fungus sort of growing all this fuzzy stuff on this plant roots here. That's all mycorrhizal fungi. Um, in addition, we also have what are called ectomycorrhizal fungi, and these, these fungi colonize the rhizoplane, which is, again is that surface of the root of the plant. Uh, what they do is they form a very, um, very thick layer of surrounding the plant roots, so you can see that here. They basically form this like hairy coat, um, and they essentially uh, act as a, a, a sort of a secondary root system for these plants on top of the plant's root system as a whole. Um, and sort of the other important classification is actually what we call arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And <clears throat> arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, they, they actually physically penetrate the, 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 um, 
the plant's root. So they essentially embed themselves in the plant and uh, are really important as, again, as the sort of the secondary root system to plants. Um, and sort of, I just want to make note of one thing about, um, about all of these different fungi that we've talked about in terms of symbiosis. They, um, they are extremely important to our agriculture, not just important just to sort of normal plants like trees that we know of, but they are really important to our agricultural system. And so corn, soybeans, and so on and so forth, major agricultural staples are influenced by these three types of fungi. So they, these symbioses are really important for us, not just sort of around nature functions. Um, but there are, um, there is this sort of trade-off that occurs um, when we're thinking about um, how much carbon a, um, and how much nutrients a soil has and how much of these symbioses occur. And so very um, low soil nutrients, you have many, many more of these symbioses. Very high, you have very low amounts of these associations. So, uh, and then finally, the sort of the final role, and I think this is the one that you all think of when you think of microbes, and well, maybe not just you all, but sort of as a global thing, um, is this pathogens. And so microbes are really important for pathogens. When we're thinking about pathogens in nature, we're thinking primarily of, um, and, and in terms of soil, we're thinking particularly about plant uh, pathogens. And, and this is important not just for natural plants, but again, agricultural systems are subject to the same exact pathogens as we find in nature. And so when we're thinking about pathogens in terms of soils, is it, we're thinking high, uh, mostly about fungi. And so for instance, um, <clears throat> Uh, phyto, 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 phythora infestans, it's always a mouthful with fungal, <laughs> fungal genus species, um, is a fungi that infects <clears throat> a couple different parts, a couple different types of plants, but it primarily infects the, the leaves of the plant. You can see this fungal growth, fungal growth here. Um, this is actually a fungal agent that caused the Great Irish Famine or the potato blight. Um, and it is actually still an extremely, um, extremely um, infectious um, agent that occurs. But uh, again, this all comes from natural soil systems. Um, in addition, we also have carnivorous fungi that um, there, so there are fungi that will prey upon um, uh, insects, they'll, they'll prey upon worms, they'll prey upon anything. So there are fungi that will actually hunt and kill things out there. Um, and if you actually wanna see how fungi are used for, uh, can be used for, uh, agriculture in terms of ants, um, I suggest you take a few minutes. It's about uh, five minutes, uh, three minutes or so to watch this video. It's really fascinating. Uh, so with that, we'll summarize the first part. So soils are incredibly complex and therefore harbor a considerable amount of di diversity in terms of microbial life. Um, there are many conditions that affect soil microbes, including water, carbon, particle size, as well as the soil composition. Uh, plants do exhibit a very sizable control over uh, the microbes in the rhizosphere, as well as in the rhizoplane, and the rhizoplane being, again, the surface of the plant root, with the rhizosphere being the soil near the plant root. And then finally, microorganisms do contribute to ecosystem functions as symbionts, decomposers, and pathogens. So um, next up is going to be marine microbiology. And so the three questions we're going to try to answer here is what are some of the key environmental factors that influence marine microbial communities? What are some key marine autotrophs and heterotrophs? And how do these organisms contribute to marine food webs? And what are the role of viruses in all this? And I think this last one is timely given the current uh, pandemic that's going on. So we have the great blue, the great blue orb um, in space. Um, the planet as a whole is a water-based planet, and most of the water is um, marine. And so understanding these marine microbes is really, really important. So marine is, ecosystems are huge. They occupy 71% of the surface of the planet and accounts for 90% of the biosphere. And the biosphere is simply just places where living things exist. They're really big. 320 million cubic miles of marine ecosystems. The average depth of the ocean is 12,000 feet or more than two miles. Um, they are important ecologically. There are over 200,000 known species of marine animals with likely more than 2 million that we don't know of, thinking of sort of ones that live deep down in the ocean. And they're important economically. There is 160 million tons of fish caught per year. So trillions of fish. 
Um, there is this sort of frightening statistic that about one third of the planet relies solely on the ocean to get their fish, which is just an astron astronomical amount of protein. Um, that being said, ocean microbes do reach very high abundance. And so this is different habitats that we have here, soil, air, so on and so forth. Um, and then we have marine waters here. So we have 10 to the five to 10 to the six cells per milliliter. So that's a lot of microbes. That's higher than say hydrothermal vents. That's higher, that's you know less than say sewage, but it's pretty high densities of microbe in a very small amount of space. Um, marine ecosystems is simply defined as any ecosystem that depends on salt water. And this also includes, includes brackish water systems too. Uh, brackish water systems are like, you know, sort of the mixing areas between fresh and salt water. So you can think of like parts of the Charles are what we call brackish. They have very low salinity, about five to 10. Whereas, you know, sort of the ocean outside of Massachusetts has um, typically, you know, 30, part, 30 parts per thousand or so. Um, there are two main categories of oceans. We have coastal systems, and so these are essentially extend out on the continental shelf, so they're essentially right by our coastlines, and these include things like estuaries, salt marshes, which I'm, bit, I'm a bit biased to because this is what I did my graduate work in, uh, but also mangroves and as well as coral reef, reefs, and then we have the open ocean, and this is basically anything that's not a coastal system. Um, and then this includes both surface waters as well as deep ocean waters. And we can just sort of visually look at this um, when we're thinking about the different types of biomes found within the ocean. There is a lot of things that, go, that is going on here. Um, and I know this sort of looks relatively uh, sort of complex, but we're gonna break down some sort of key things that matter here. Um, Cause you can just, you can sort of think about this ocean is not just, it doesn't just sort of differ from say left to right on this graph. It differs pretty dramatically from north to south on this graph. And so again, we have that coastal system here and then we have that oceanic system here. And so there's a number of different things um, that sort of um, differ as we change. Uh, so salt is pretty consistent. Um, throughout the ocean, so it's pretty equally as salty here as it is down here, just as a note. Um, but the water column, as we again, as we go from north to south or east to west, is not uniform. Oops. So the first thing you'll notice is that uh, temperature varies pretty dramatically. So up in the upper parts of the ocean, it's you know depending on where you are, it's going to be you know say 20 degrees Celsius or you know about room temperature. But as you go down, down, and down, where there's less and less sunlight the temperature is decreasing. What you'll also notice that we have this region here, the top 200 meters of the ocean is what we call the photic zone. And the photic zone is where all the photosynthesis occurs in the ocean. Uh, the other thing that sort of dramatically change is, <clears throat> is the pH. As you go from top to bottom of the pH, um, it gets, it's sort of slightly, it's like, it's pretty basic here. And then as you sort of go down, it gets slightly acidic and then it gets really basic again. Um, and so this is sort of the ocean. It's very, again, it's very dynamic um, um, and it's very sort of, uh, uh, sort of different as you go from these different zones. So if you're in the photic zone versus the aphotic zone. Um, but the ocean has a number of important chemical and physical factors. And so we, the sort of the key things are we're thinking about how much oxygen is dissolved in the water itself, what the temperature of the water is, what the pH of the water is, and how much light is present. Um, and so we're going to start off with light because it is the most, arguably the most important thing for understanding how oceans function. And so as you all know, without with, with, if we didn't have light, there would be no photosynthesis. And when we're thinking about anything in the ocean, it all starts with understanding how photosynthesis works. And so photosynthesis, in terms of how much light there is, is an extremely important thing. In the open ocean, the primary productivity, so how we're getting new carbon into the system, is driven 100% by microbes. There's no plants out there. There's no algae out there. So any carbon that is coming into these systems is from microbes, in particular our cyanobacteria and some algae. But these algae aren't like, you know, big algae that you would see, say, near, you know, in, in, in the Boston Harbor. These are microscopic algae. Um, and so as I mentioned, there are two main ocean zones. There's the, there's the photic zone where there is light present, and then there's the aphotic zone where light is absent. And so our primary producers were, live in the photic zone where there is light. Um, the photic zone does extend from, from the surface down to about 200 meters. Um, and this 
is the sort of the best case scenario that 200 meters is sort of the maximum that light can penetrate and uh, be still be useful for photosynthesis but it does depend on the turbidity of water so if you go to boston harbor the photic zone does not extend down to 200 meters it extends about five meters simply because of how cloudy and turbid the water is um, that being said, uh, the photic zone is the area with the greatest abundance of marine life. Um, remember, our, our, we need our primary producers. They are the base of the marine food chain. Um, and that being said, not all areas within the photic zone are the same. Um, there are different wavelengths of light and they, have, they vary in how they penetrate um, down into the ocean. And then in addition, there are different organisms <clears throat> have adapted to live at different depths within the photic zone. And so we can look at um, sort of just a these different colors of light that come off the sun. So we have ultraviolet, and then we have the Roy G. Biv, so red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and then infrared light. And what you'll see, you'll notice is that this is the depth at which 99% of the light is absorbed by the water itself. And what you'll notice is that as depending on where you are in terms of depth, you have different amounts of light. So if you're very, very deep, so 250 meters, you still have blue light but you have no red light, you have no uh, orange light, yellow light, and so on. And so um, as, you, as you may or may, as we, actually we didn't actually cover photosynthesis simply because most of you didn't like our talk about <laughs> um, microbial uh, metabolisms, but um, blue light and green light are the two most important ones for photosynthesis, in particular green light. Um, <clears throat> and so there are a number of different, um, the, in terms of depth, um, the, you, uh, depending on what type of photosynthesis you use, you will live at a dip, different depth. And so what I mean by that is some photosynthesizers can use, say, violet light. Others can use, say, blue light. Most, most, micro, most microbes prefer blue light and green light, but there are microbes that can use yellow and orange light as well. So they can live at different depths depending on their preference for light. And so there are a number um, really important types of bacteria that live in the ocean and that are photosynthetic. Um, one of the most important ones is actually Prochlorococcus. And we've actually met Prochlorococcus before. Um, these are bacteria that can actually use sulfur in the membranes, the membrane lipids instead of phosphorus. We've also talked about them in terms of their viruses as well. Um, this is a genus of bacteria that are discovered in 1988. And I say discovered, they existed before. Um, They've existed for a very, very long time. Uh, but they are one of the most abundant organisms in the oceans. There is 2.8 to 3 octillion, or 10 to the 27 individuals across all of our global oceans. And they produce an estimated 13 to 48 percent of the global photosynthetic, photosynthetic production of oxygen. So every breath you take, about upwards of half of it come from just one organism. It's absolutely astounding for how much, how important these microorganisms are to the ocean. And there are different, what we call ecotypes um, that have different preferences for light. And so their abundances change with the depth in the water. So let's take a deep dive and look into uh, the sort of the two types of these, mic of these microbes. So the first is highlight plochorococcus, and these occupy shallower depths. They have lots of chlorophyll A, which is really good at capturing red, orange, and yellow wavelengths of light. And they have, um, uh, and so that's, that's high light. And then we have low light, and they occupy deeper depths. And so they can occupy depths at up to 200 meters, and they have lots of what is called chlorophyll B, which is really good at capturing blue light. And as you remember from that table I showed you, blue light penetrates really, really well. And we can actually physically look at the depth. And so we have all these different ecotypes of Plochorococcus. Each color is a different ecotype. And this is just different spots. So one degree north, 25 degree north, 48 degree north. So, uh, you know, mass, just to put this in perspective, this is about the equator. This is like Florida-ish. Uh, and this is um, like Maine. You know, Massachusetts is about 42 north. But what you'll notice is that their, their abundance um, versus depth here does change. And so these different um, ecotypes or these different slightly, slightly uh, different prochlorococcuses have different preferences in terms of um, where they like to grow. Some like to grow at really deep depths, others like to grow at really shallow depths. So it's actually pretty fascinating how their ecology is. Um, if anyone is interested in that, I'd be more than happy to send you a few um, a few articles about Prochlorococcus because I think they're pretty cool. 
Um, so directly tied to uh, prochlorococcus is what we call the chlorophyll maximum, which is measured as the chlorophyll concentrations, um, as the chlorophyll concentrations peak below the surface. Um, and essentially, we could ask this question of why? And essentially is they escape the harshest light. And so um, remember, not all light is good light. Ultraviolet light is not good light. Not all wavelengths of light are good. And so if you can escape the harshest light, you can, you can be essentially better protected. You can also potentially be more, um, um, uh, more productive, more efficient in your photosynthesis. So uh, the next question we can ask is how do they get there? Um, well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, so some photosynthetic organisms naturally uh, intentionally will move to different depths so they will swim. Um, others can regulate their buoyancy, so changing how much lipids or changing how much uh, their cellular composition they have to allow them to float um, or sink as they need. So, um, so that's light. Um, light is again really important simply because it forms the basis of um, our photosynthetic chain. And remember that, photos that photosynthetic chain is essentially the basis for all the carbon in the system. So moving on from here, we're going to talk about temperature. And I think temperature is pretty straightforward, it's pretty easy to understand, but temperatures vary as a function of depth and they also change as a function of latitude. Um, um, I will say though, in general though, Prochlorococcus does not like cold waters, it prefers um, it prefers warmer waters like the tropics. Um, and I will also mention uh, in replace of Plocarococcus, um, in colder waters, it, uh, in a bacteria called Synecococcus comes in and dominates the photosynthetic chain. But as, you, as I mentioned, temperature does change pretty dramatically, um, both, both um, top to bottom. So as you go from surface waters down to deeper waters, it gets colder. But as you move away from the equator, as you're going north, as you, or as you're going south towards either pole, um, our waters get colder. And um, what you'll notice is here, we have, we have a map of the globe. We have Plocorococcus at the top, and then Synecococcus at the bottom. And what you notice is that Plocorococcus really, really likes it in the warm waters. And as you move away from the equator, it starts to go down in abundance. And as you'll notice that Prochlorococcus is essentially absent in these Arctic and Antarctic waters. Um, <clears throat> but what you'll notice is that as we, again, as we move away from the equator, Synecococcus um, is present, but it does ultimately take over in these colder northern waters. Um, there, uh, that, that what we said, there, there, there is actually Synecococcus down here in Antarctica. It's just a really under, um, studied area of the globe because it's a really, really hard place to work scientifically. But what you notice is that Synecococcus does take over in the, in the uh, North Pole, which is much, much easier to study relative to Plocarococcus. So Synecococcus are a cyanobacteria. They're very, very small, 0.8 to 1.5 microns. They are very unremarkable looking under a microscope. They are widespread in marine environments. Again, they prefer those colder waters, but you do find them in the tropical waters. Um, they are really abundant. They can range from 1,000 to upwards of 200,000 cells per milliliter of, of water, um, whether it's marine or um, fresh water. Um, they are um, pretty abundant. So there are seven times 10 to the 26 Synecococcus on this planet. And that's in contrast to uh, 10 to the 27 Plochlorococcus. So they are really important. Um, combined with Plochlorococcus, they are the main sources of fixed carbon and oxygen to the oceans. Um, that being said, they do not, Synecococcus does not fix nitrogen. Um, uh, Plochlorococcus does um, fix nitrogen. Um, uh, relative to Plochlorococcus, Synecococcus does better at colder temperatures as well as high nitrogen concentrations. Um, there's also there's sort of this one other um, photosynthetic um, green organism that's not particularly important, but it's actually a really cool organism. It's called um, Acariochlorus marina. So it was an organism that was discovered in 1993. And it is a relatively close relative of Synecococcus. It does use what we call chlorophyll D, which absorbs far red light, um, which is actually kind of interesting because it does imply that um, photosynthesis was possible with far red light. Um, and so what's interesting about this is this is the, right, the light that's emitted by what are called red dwarf stars. And 
interesting enough, a red dwarf star is the majority of stars within our Milky Way galaxy, which is where we live. And so kind of interesting that, you know, from a sort of a astrobiology standpoint, it's potentially that these planets um, that are orbiting these type of stars might have these sort of something similarly related to um, Karyochloris marina. Um, so this sort of, this, this organism that I've discovery sort of expands the potential places where we can find life in the uh, solar system. Um, there are some other important autotrophs that we need to talk about. Um, and so this is actually a picture that um, I took from uh, my time when I briefly dabbled as a marine microbiologist. Um, and so this is Trichodesmium. It's a filamentous cyanobacteria. It is a major marine diazotroph, so it fixes the nitrogen, so it takes atmospheric nitrogen and makes it into ammonia or a fertilizer. And it accounts for about half of all the nitrogen fixation in the ocean. They live as these sort of these filaments um, that are essentially tens to hundreds of cells strung together or as colonies. So like what you sort of think about um, what you think about as um, in terms of what's growing on your plates in the lab. Um, these colonies can be tens to hundreds of filaments essentially bunched together. Um, these colonies and these filaments are naked to the to the to the uh, are visible to the naked eye, which is what you're seeing here. This is all trichodesmium. You can see these from planes. So I have a picture somewhere on my computer of me in an airplane, 25,000 feet, and you can see the trichodesmium out there. Uh, interestingly enough, for those of you that did not know this, uh, trichodesmium can turn red, which is how the Red Sea actually got its name because the Red Sea has lots of trichodesmium in it. Um, the other thing that um, Reds, the, uh, these trichodesmium do is they actually, they allow other microbes to colonize them. So they do provide this sort of other um, area for um, habitat for microbes in the ocean. Um, and another sort of type of microbe that we think about in terms of uh, being photosynthetically important as our algae, sort of this catch-all term to include many photosynthetic or single cell eukaryotes. Um, and they're red and green algae, diatoms, dianflagellates. Um, trichodesmium is much more abundant, less so for algae. So, so that was our photosynthetic um, look. Um, but most of the organisms, but the most abundant organisms in the oceans and on the planet are actually heterotrophs. So they're consuming organic carbon. They, again, they, they consume all that dissolved organic carbon. So carbon that is released by dead um, phytoplankton, so our Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus, they consume that for biomass and energy. Um, and this, all this dissolved organic carbon comes from dead cells, waste, as well as this thing called marine snow. And marine snow is essentially when something dies um, and, it, and, and, and in the ocean, unless it's consumed at the surface, it falls down to the, the bottom of the ocean as snow. So that's marine snow. Um, but they have a, these microbes that are um, heterotrophic, they have a, a wide range of adaptations that allow them to find and utilize different foods. And so they are typically motile, so they have our flagella. Um, they have environmental sensing, so lots of chemoreceptors to pick up what's going on in the environment. They have lots of permeases that allow them to transport organic carbon from outside the cell to inside the cell. And they, they essentially have the capacity to break down a wide variety of polymers or complex carbon sources, particularly from Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus. And the other sort of important thing that they have is they have the capacity to take up ammonia, oops, ammonia and phosphate. So, you know, they need that to you know, make their DNA and proteins. Um, one of the best studied cases is actually Vibrio. And so you, you probably have heard of Vibrio at some shape and form. Um, in particular, you probably heard of cholera. And so Vibrio cholera is a, bacteria, is a gamma proteobacteria found within the genus Vibrio that is, really, that is particularly abundant in the ocean. And so this is a genus of bacteria commonly found in salt water. Um, and so in our quorum sensing lecture, we talked about Vibrio harvei. It's the uh, quorum sensing bioluminescent organism. Um, I mentioned cholera. Um, and there's also a number of Vibrio associated with seafood poisoning, including uh, Volnificus and Parahemolyticus. Um, they're particularly nasty. But uh, one of the important things that Vibrio do, they're actually important decomposers. And they're actually one of the very few groups of organisms that, that can degrade chitin. And chitin, as I've mentioned previously, is an important um, component of arthropod skeleton. So you're thinking about arthropods as in insects, spiders, um, other types of arachnids, um, crabs, 
And um, anything you can sort of think about with six to eight legs has chitin. And so as such, chitin is one of the most abundant molecules on the planet. It is the second most abundant molecule on the planet after cellulose. So it's a really important molecule as a whole. And these Vibrio are the main degraders. We can actually look at how much chitin is found in a cell culture with days. So this is a, a, an isolate of Vibrio harvei. And what you'll notice is that chitin is here in black. So you'll see the, the bacteria will degrade chitin over time and it degrades chitin into um, partially into glucose. So then it can use in, as glucose. And what you notice is the amount of Vibrio increases over time. So these Vibrio are really important for de the degradation of chitin. Um, another important microorganism is what we call SAR-11. It's also known as Pelagibacter ubique, which is essentially the ocean bacteria that is everywhere. And so uh, SAR-11 is really interesting. It's a tiny heterotrophic alpha proteobacterium, 0.3 to 0.9 microns long. It is likely the most abundant microbe in the world. And so at its peak in the summer, it can account for about 50% of all bacteria in the ocean. Um, to put this in perspective, we talked about Chlorococcus, which is 10 to the 27 bacteria in the ocean. SAR-11 or Pelagibacter is 10 to the 28 cells. It is incredibly abundant, and as such, it's really, really important. And so it gets its name SAR-11 from the Sargasso Sea. This is a portion of the Atlantic Ocean off Bermuda. It's about 90 miles, about, sorry, about 90 kilometers off the coast of Bermuda. Um, it was discovered by its 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequence in 1990, and it was actually just recently cultured. And so it, it is a really important organism, so we're going to talk about it a little bit. Um, so SAR-11 is perfectly adapted for low nutrient conditions. It has tiny cells, and it's very, very tiny genome. They have lots of sensors for nitrogen, phosphorus, and iron. They can double once every 30 hours. Um, but um, it is very, that is a bit slow for marine microbes. It's also very slow for what we work with in the lab. But they, the important thing is they can divide in severely nutrient deprived conditions. And I, and I should mention this is that the vast majority of the ocean, the open ocean, is, has very, very low nutrients. So that's why SAR 11 does really well. Um, SAR 11 does, is not photosynthetic, but it has this class of enzymes called proteorhodopsins. And basically, they basically can make ATP directly from light. And the other thing that SAR-11 does is it actually can colonize and utilize marine snow. And as I mentioned, marine snow is essentially uh, particles of dead things or things that cells have secreted that clump together, that sink down the water column, thus falling as snow. And so they, these, these, this marine snow is high on organic carbon and nutrients, so they're hot spots for heterotrophs, and their population densities are particularly high with 10 to the 9 per 10 to the... Uh, 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 bacteria per milliliter, so very similar to what we see in soils. Um, the, the sinking marine snow does leave an extended plume of dissolved organic matter um, behind as it falls, so um, it allows the bacteria in the water column to consume it. Um, interestingly, about 50% of all marine bacterial carbon is supplied by these plumes, and this is why we see so many bacteria outside of the photic zone, simply because all this dead stuff is raining down um, on the, uh, down in the water column. And so this is just a, um, a very sort of simple diagram where we have marine snow, it's falling down, and it's sort of leaching all these things out, whether it's carbon, nitrogen, iron, silica, and so on and so forth. And all these things are allowing bacteria and other organisms to essentially feed um, on this marine snow and what is falling with it. So it's a really important thing to think about with marine snow. Um, one other thing we haven't sort of sort of touched upon is how dynamic marine environments are. As I'm sure you all know, there are tides, there are waves, there is movement both vertically and horizontally in the ocean. So soils, uh, very much like soils, oceans are complex. And there's a lot going on here. So there's var varied physical parameters, salinity, temperature, and so on and so forth. There's varying levels of ke uh, chemical parameters, including how much oxygen and other types of gases, um, other, other important things like say calcium and magnesium. Um, there's lots of sort of biological, both floral and faunal, so you know, creatures and plants. Um, there are other types of environmental parameters, such as UV um, and other types of sort of nasty compounds out there like hydrogen peroxide. Um, there are extreme amounts of depth. Again, uh, we have depths up to 11,000 meters, which is absolutely 
um, insane in terms of depth. And these pressures can exceed one uh, 1100 atmospheres and the temperatures can range from sub-zero to over 130 degrees and the salinity can range from below 10 to upwards of 40 degree 40 parts per thousand um, and seawater is really chemically complex and is the most chemically complex fluid that we know of that occurs naturally there is over 95 elements so if you look at the periodic table 95 of all 100 and well 108 say 118 elements on that table are found in seawater. And so this is a really, really com dynamic and complex environment. And the other thing that marine environments have that is very different than terrestrial environments is it moves. There is currents that act both locally. So we can think of in the, um, the Gulf of Maine here, off of Massachusetts, there is currents that act locally here both on small scales and larger scales. Um, and then there are global currents. So there are, there's currents that go around the entire globe. There is, you know, currents that sort of wrap around our own Atlantic Ocean. There's, you know, monster ones that go over the entire Pacific Ocean. So water moves and it moves again at the local scale and to the global scale. It's absolutely incredible how much water in the ocean moves on an everyday basis. Um, so that being said, um, there are pretty high turnover times. And when I say turnover times, it means how much, it, how long it takes for the population of microbes to divide and go from one to two, or for a population to be a completely new set of cells. Um, and it, it, so turnover times um, are pretty um, fast. It takes weeks, um, days to weeks for most microbes in the ocean. Um, but typically we see a turnover time of about daily. So every day it refreshes the cells present in the ocean. And that's directly in contrast to soils, which can take months to years, sometimes even millennia to turn over. Um, and so because a, a whole new community can be present in those days, the, the conditions that change on those timescales can alter microbial community structure. So if we have, say, an algal bloom, this can, vast, this can pretty dramatically alter microbial communities. And so directly tied to how fast communities um, turn over is marine viruses. And so we can ask this question, um, with turnover rates so high, why isn't the ocean filled with Prochlorococcus? Why isn't it just like all Prochlorococcus and Cynecococcus? Well, there are sort of two types of controls that occur on marine microorganisms. This is These are called top-down controls, and we're particularly thinking about predation and viruses. And so viral infection rates in the global ocean occur at a scale that is really hard to comprehend. But every second in the ocean, there are 10 to the 23 viral infections. 10 to the 23 viruses is an absolutely insane amount of viral infections that occur on an everyday basis in this ocean. <laughs> and it's absolutely insane. So we can look at some estimates based upon um, that bit, some estimate based upon some techniques called in called um, electron micro uh, electron microscopy as well as these filtering assays that can show that any at any given time ten to the, ten to fifty percent of the bacteria are infected by viruses, which represents about a half you know ten to fifty percent mortality rate for marine bacteria. Um, that being said, about f the viruses kill about fifty percent of all bacterial life in the ocean on the daily basis. Absolutely insane. So just put this in perspective, we know of a bacteriophage called HTVC01OP. This attacks Pelagibacter ublique. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and so this virus actually, uh, because it attacks Pelagibacter ublique, um, it actually is probably the most common organism on the planet. Because remember, Pelagibacter is 10 to the 28 cells. This virus is probably 10 to the 29. So it's absolutely incredibly abundant. Um, but viruses do have an extremely high amount of numbers. So we can look at biomass in the ocean. Biomass is about 90% viruses, I'm sorry, bacteria and archaea, 5% protists, and about 5% viruses. But if we look at abundance, 90%, 95% of all abundance in the ocean comes from viruses with a small proportion of protists and a small proportion of viruses. So viruses greatly outpace the abundance of bacteria. So let's ask this next question. How does this all come together? How can we have such vast 
amounts of viral infections every single day? And how does this all work to make this ocean a functioning system? So let's talk about sort of a, um, a pretty simple uh, system here. Um, and so the idea being is we have we have sunlight that comes in, it's photosynthesized, the bacteria uptake CO2, um, they produce oxygen. Um, and what they're doing is these phytoplankton, they're releasing organic matter, and these organic matter can form these, these um, particles, that marine snow, that can sink. And remember, as the marine snow sinks, it releases different compounds along the way. And then these organic, the phytoplankton then can be consumed by zooplankton, which are microscopic eukaryotes, which can then be eaten by fish and bigger things such as birds or say marine mammals or sharks. Um, but these, these fish and these zooplankton poop and that feeds these microbial uh, communities. And then the other sort of important thing to think about here is these viruses will attack these phytoplankton and other bacteria, which will then release organic com compounds into the ocean. So this is sort of this natural sort of uh, pretty high level of connectivity here where there's this natural balance between how fast these phytoplankton are doing their thing, how, fat, how much they're getting affected by viruses, and how all the sort of the, the heterotrophic bacteria are eating sort of all this organic matter. And you can sort of see that uh, sort of the top of the ocean, there's a lot going on, but as you go deeper and deeper, um, there's very, very little amounts of carbon that make it down there. Um, again, there's no light down there, so there's no photosynthesizers. Um, and a very small proportion of carbon, about 1 to 15% of the original carbon that was photosynthesized, actually makes it down below 500 meters. And about 0.1% actually makes it down to the bottom of the ocean onto the floor. So. There are um, a number of things that can potentially limit how much photosynthetic activity that can occur. Um, principally, we like to think about um, we like to think about uh, nitrogen being the most and most sort of limiting thing. Remember, nitrogen is a necessity for our um, proteins, amino acids, DNA, things like that. But there is this this sort of idea out there called the iron hypothesis, um, and it's actually kind of interesting because. Um, <clears throat> Um, this is a, a, a hypothesis that's put out um, in areas called high nutrient, low chlorophyll, HNLC zones. And the idea being is that there's a lot of nutrients, so lots of nitrogen, lots of phosphorus, which we think would normally limit these oceans, um, but they are limited by iron. And it's actually kind of an interesting thing um, that if we added iron to these area, phytoplankton will grow up, suck up that CO2, and then bury it deep in the ocean. And so there's this hypothesis has been put forth that we could potentially use this, uh, these, high, these HNLC zones to potentially mitigate the effects of climate change. And so there is some pretty interesting, um, um, <clears throat> there is some pretty interesting things uh, in terms of evidence. So in 1991, uh, Mount Pinatubo eruption, erupted, dumped it a ton of iron into this parts of the ocean, which actually led to a noticeable amount of algal blooms and a measurable decrease in atmospheric CO2 and an increase in O2. So it might be something, um, this iron hypothesis might be something we can actually use to geoengineer and help mitigate climate change, just as a note. But that being said, most of the ocean is actually limited by nitrogen. And, and so um, just sort of build upon this a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> uh, so there's a quote by John Martin. He said, give me, a half, give me a half a tanker of iron and I will give you another ice age. And so <laughs> uh, we've actually tried this 13 times. We've tried adding iron to these HNLC zones and it's actually been really, really ineffective um, most cases. Um, so we, we managed to stimulate some burial of carbon, but mostly we did not. Um, and most didn't have any burial. Um, and it's actually what ended up happening is most of the heterotrophs present in the ocean, as we've talked about, um, thinking about pelagibacter, actually converted, ate all that, ate all that carbon um, that was fixed by these um, photosynthesizers and put it right back into the atmosphere. Um, and we did succeed in promoting the growth of diatoms, but it has actually been a, a pretty, um, um, a pretty uh, ineffective way to sort of fight um, <laughs> to fight climate change. But it's a sort of interesting thing to think about, potentially using the ocean to fight a really globally um, important problem. And so last, last section, we finish with the smell of Earth. There is the smell of the ocean. 
And there is the smell of the ocean, which is dimethyl sulfide. Um, and so marine phytoplankton and bacteria produce dim dimethyl sulfide or DMS. And DMS is characterized as the smell of the sea. And it plays a key role in the smell in a combination with other compounds. But DMS is the most abundant biological sulfur compound emitted to the atmosphere um, by phytoplankton. It is oxidized um, in the marine atmosphere to various sulfur-containing compounds, also sulfur dioxide, that create new aerosols, we act, which act as cloud condensation, which is pretty cool. Um, so it's, the idea being is through this interaction, interaction um, with cloud formation, we can have a massive production of atmospheric DMS, and it might actually have a significant impact on the Earth's climate. So what these microbes are doing in the ocean might actually be influencing the climate. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and I just want to just sort of highlight this, um, one of this last thing is the, uh, the Sorcerer 2 expedition um, led by this sort of controversial figure, um, J. Craig Venter, um, that occurred from 2003 to 2007. He did the Global Ocean Sampling Expedition. He basically he sampled all these different places around the globe. He, he, owns a, he, he owns a really valuable pharmaceutical company, but he just happens to do this because he enjoys it. Um, they started in the Sargasso Sea, outside the ocean and they went all the way around the globe and they discovered uh, six million new genes every 200 miles they they basically discovered that 85 percent of the sequences were unique and they identified well over 25 million taxes so there has been some pretty um, fascinating things that have occurred um, um, in terms of scientifically in terms of this ocean so let's wrap up part two. So marine systems are more complex than is typically assumed, and there are many environmental factors that affect microbes, such as light and temperature. Microbes play a key role in marine food webs, primarily as primary producers, but um, they also are really important consumers. Viruses are super abundant in marine systems, and they serve to keep populations of microbes in check. Um, and then sort of the last thing is iron doesn't save the climate, but is worth a shot. Um, and remember, the smell of the ocean comes directly from DMS or this dimethyl sulfur. So uh, sort of the final part of the lecture and the, um, <clears throat> um, not the least interesting, but I think the less well-researched aspect is extreme microbiology. And this is not microbiology like done like snowboarding or something like that. This is microbiology done in extreme environments, environments that are extremely salt, extremely acidic, extremely hot, extremely cold. And so we're gonna try to answer these three questions. Um, what makes an environment extreme and what habitats are considered extreme? Um, what are some key taxa that live in extreme environments and what are the adaptations that they have to live there? And how have these organisms contributed to our understanding of biology? And so, um, <clears throat> And so before we sort of go on and talk a little bit about these extreme microbial communities, uh, we actually want to ask our two sort of integral components to microbial ecology. So how do microbial communities respond so rapidly to environmental change, i.e. days after an oil spill? <clears throat> um, you know, if after an oil spill, how do the microbes that degrade these compounds come from? Um, the question was, they were always there. And the next question, so this ties directly the idea into this, everything is everywhere, but the environment selects hypothesis. This was put forth by Lorenz Boss Becking in 1934 with help from this man named Martinez Bejerink. Um, really, Bejerink was a really important microbiologist in the soil, just as a note. And so that's what these two handsome gentlemen look like. You know, classic old white guy, stern face, you know, scientist that you think about when you think about a scientist from the, from, you know, a hundred years ago or so. So um, there's this idea of everything is everywhere, um, which implies that microorganisms have unlimited dispersible capabilities, capabilities which means they can go anywhere, um, such that they erase the effects of evolutionary and ecological events. So the idea being that speciation typically occur requires isolation, but microbes disperse so, disperse so rapidly and extensively that isolation isn't a thing for them. Um, furthermore, is that every place has all the microbes, but the proportion and the relative abundance of things does change. The, the, environment, does, the environment selects proportion implies that the, the different environments maintain the distinctive microbial assemblages or communities, and the structures of these communities is determined by environmental conditionings. 
Um, <clears throat> this is actually something that the environment selecting does hold up pretty good. Microbes are non-randomly dispersed. There's lots of evidence for this. Um, this is due simply due to different environmental conditions that are harboring distinct communities, as we've talked about with the ocean, as we talked about with the soil. Um, and communities do change in response to environmental conditions. And so like the hydrocarbon degrader um, that pop up after an oil spill. And things after disturbance occurs, life does return to normals. Everything isn't everywhere though. Um, this is the part that hasn't held up too well at all. Um, there are some evidence that does support this. So for example, all gut microbiota um, has bacteroidetes and all soils have, act like, have all actinobacteria regardless of where in the world you are and who you are as a person. So, um, but it does break down when we include processes like horizontal gene transfer or the concept of the species. Um, and this level of complexity can be seen everywhere. Um, microbes are dispersion limited, so you can leave a petri dish on a plate open for a very long time, um, <clears throat> and nothing will things will come in, but things um, it'll be sort of a limited amount of bacteria that can colonize that petri dish. And there's lots of examples of um, what we call endemic taxa or taxa that you don't find really anywhere else. You only find them in one specific location. Uh, but this concept did, uh, idea of everything is everywhere, did last a very long time. It only challenged once modern techniques had developed, and it may return uh, actually as we improve our methodology. But it is still something that is pervasive in the history and literature of microbial ecology as a field. There's been a lot of work that has been done on the basis of the concept, and this actually was once considered a fundamental truth of microbiology. Uh, but as a hypothesis, it actually you know, it, it provides a, uh, it's not particularly true, but it does provide a nice null hypothesis to test against. Um, there are some other rules, you know, quotation marks around the rules in microbial ecology or paradigms that do apply across the field of microbial ecology, regardless of the group or the environment in question. These include uh, bacterial cell size is inversely correlated with generation time. The idea being that the slower you grow, they, they typically are smaller in size. Um, if, an, and if a metabolic strategy is thermodynamically feasible, there's some microbe somewhere that uses the strategy, i.e. if there's some compound you can develop, you can get energy from, there's some microbe out there that can use it. Um, in most environments, the, mo the majority of taxa are rare. Uh, microbes like macrobes or big things follow the species area relationship. Uh, relationship. The idea being that the larger area surveyed, the more taxa you find in that given area. And finally, most microbes are different, difficult to culture, um, and it's not, it's not that they're impossible to culture, it's just very, very difficult. Anyways, so those are sort of the, the, the foundational rules of microbial ecology. Um, let's move on to extreme microbiology, which is clearly the most extreme form of microbiology. So extreme habitats are habitat where life is difficult based upon some physical um, or environmental or chemical factor, including temperature, both high and low, water availability, pressure, pH, or salinity. Um, but when many, uh, many of these systems were believed to be devoid of life simply because the conditions were too extreme. But as we, as we sort of talked about, um, it really doesn't matter where you go on this planet, the top of the atmosphere, the bottom of the ocean, anywhere in between, there's always microbes. And extreme habitats are all over the planet, whether we're thinking about the bottom of the ocean being extreme, extremely dry, dry deserts, both, you know, say in the Sahara or say the, the Antarctic, uh, hydrothermal vents and pools, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, hydrothermal pools like in Yellowstone, hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, hypersaline lakes, and the list goes on and on. And all what these all have in common is they have organisms called extremophiles. And this is something we've talked about a little bit in the lab in a little bit in lecture before, but we're gonna dive a bit more into these um, organisms. Um, and so an extremophile is any organism that lives in extreme conditions that are de detrimental to most life on Earth. Pretty much all extremophiles are microbial, but some people can argue that potentially like a cactus or some plants that grow in extreme environments are extremophiles, but typically when we think of an extremophile, we're thinking about microbes. Um, the term is based on a condition that they thrive in. And so an acidophile it, it likes pHs of less than three, an alkophile likes pHs greater than four, uh, thermophiles like pHs greater than 45 degrees, a hypothermophile likes pHs, um, temperatures higher than 80 degrees, whereas a psychrophile likes uh, temperatures less than 15 degrees. 
Um, halophile likes high salt, piezophile likes high pressure, azerophile likes low water content. So like honey has very low water content and they have xerophiles. And there are others and you can have combinations. So you can be a thermoacidophile, which means you like it very hot and you like it very acidic. Um, and this is actually a relatively new area of microbiology. It started um, principally with a, a scientist named Thomas Brock. Um, if you were taking a, a microbiology course at a different university or college, you would uh, use Brock's um, microbiology textbook um, simply because he's one of the sort of the, the founding fathers of this um, sort of area of microbiology, and he happened to have written a textbook, just as a fun note. Um, so. Um, the, for the longest time, uh, archaea was actually directly tied to this concept of extremophile. We thought all extremophiles were archaea and all archaea were extremophiles. Um, simply because the first archaea discovered were extremophiles. Um, this is, but we do know now that not, not all archaea are extremophiles. Archaea are extremely abundant in the ocean and in the soils. Archaea are everywhere. Um, and there are many, many bacterial extremophiles. But that being said, archaea do love to live in extreme environments. These include halophiles, so halobacterium, thermophiles, so methanopyrus can actually reproduce at 122 degrees C, so 22 degrees C above the boiling point of water. Um, we have acidophiles or alkophiles, so uh, Picrophilus toridus grows at a pH of zero which is uh, the functional equivalent of growing in sulfuric acid, which is extremely, uh, extremely, extremely acidic, would basically melt your skin off uh, if given enough time. Um, archaea have a number of physiological features that allow them to um, essentially effectively live in the, uh, these extreme environments. So remember, archaea and bacteria differ in their cellu cellular membrane and their cellular wall composition. <laughs> So archaea have ether-linked or isoprenoidal branched membranes. These, remember, these can occur with monolayers or bilayers, and they have all sorts of diverse head groups and ring structures that allow them to be different. So just as a remember, um, <clears throat> um, our archaeal cell membranes are distinct from our bacterial ones. They have ether-linked lipids. Uh, and these lipid structures are proposed to provide protection from the extreme environment temperatures, pH, salinity, and so on and so forth that these archaea can potentially live in. Um, and so just as a note, we, ex we can experimentally remove the ability to make specific head groups on these archaea. And actually what it does is it makes these archaea less adapted to growing at very high, very low or very, uh, very low pH. So for instance, this is optical density. This is the time in days. And you can see that at pH 3.5, the archaea grows perfectly fine. Uh, but you see, you'll notice is that at a pH of 1.6, where this archaea could normally grow, um, if it has the, in, the inability to make this ring structure, it physically cannot grow at that very high pH, I'm sorry, that very low pH. So the archaea do have some pretty other um, important adaptions in terms of their cellular membranes and, and cellular walls to allow them to physically um, survive in these conditions. Um, there are a number of other adaptations that microorganisms have um, that allow them to survive um, at very extreme temperatures. So uh, when you have uh, when you have a sort of massive changes in temperatures, they, you can increase the uh, saturated fatty acids in your plasma membranes. You can develop heat stable enzymes um, that resist denaturation, so falling apart. Um, if you're at high pressure, um, you can increase the proportion of fatty acids in your membrane to prevent it from becoming waxy, gelled, or impervious to nutrients. Um, if you have a very acidic or very alkaline environment, you can pump protons in and out of the cell to keep your inside um, near neutral, um, or you can develop acid toler tolerant enzymes. So let's look at extreme files in action. And we're going to start off by looking at uh, Yellowstone. Um, in particular, we're going to be thinking about the Grand Prismatic Spring. So water is uh, about 189 degrees Fahrenheit when it bubbles up. And this is right in the range for extreme thermophiles. Um, <clears throat> in terms of our microorganisms, it's dominated by a group of bacteria called uh, Aquifex and Archaea. Um, the different colors come from different photosynthetic organisms that we see here. So all this change in colors that we're seeing, both small and large scale, simply comes from all the different photosynthetic pigments 
i.e. chlorophyll, that occurs in these symptom, in these areas. Um, it does become more blue-green in winter and becomes much more yellow in summer. So the innermost ring that we see here in yellow is our friend Synecococcus. So the water is essentially just barely cool enough to be habitable. So it's 165 degrees Fahrenheit, so pretty warm. Uh, um, that being said, the, uh, the organisms that live there do prefer to be slightly um, cooler at 149 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, to put this in perspective, the, the sort of the uh, threshold for human pain in terms of temperature is about 130 degrees Fahrenheit. So you would be in quite a deal of pain if you stuck your hand in here. Um, the next band we see, we can see the orange band. So here we're seeing sort of these orange bands and we're seeing it move out here. This is around 149 degrees. This is dominated by Synecococcus and Chloroflexi. Um, each bacteria produce different types of chlorophyll and these pigments called carotenoids would help protect them from harmful sunlight. And the net result lives in orange. So they, you know, yellow mixed with, um, what, red-ish colors give you that sort of orangey color. Uh, the outermost band, um, which is about 130 degrees, so we're starting to see the browns there. Um, it's about 130 degrees, um, and so the browns are sort of out here. Um, this is about 131 degrees, and there's a diverse group of microbes with lots of different pigments that ultimately come together to form a net result of brown. Um, usually we associate brown with being like waste matter, but if you combine enough things, um, you get brown. So that's the grand prismatic spring. It's organized by temperature and different types of chlorophyll. Uh, next up is going to be deep sea hydrothermal vents, and these are really, really cool things. Um, so the hydrothermal vents are essentially form at location where seawater makes magma. These were first discovered in the late 70s. And uh, one of the cool things, if you've never seen a hydrothermal vent, they are teeming with all sorts of crazy and wacky life, including crazy crabs and, you know, six feet long worms and all these cool things. So if you've never seen a hydrothermal vent, uh, I would recommend Googling uh, hydrothermal vents and uh, uh, planet Earth. Uh, or, I'm sorry, uh, Blue Planet and listen to David Attenborough talk about um, these hydrothermal vents. Anyways, moving on. Um, these uh, hydrothermal vents are found in zones of a great tectonic activity. So the plates that we live on are sort of moving and magma is coming up. Um, there are two different types of hydrothermal vents. There's the black smokers. Um, these emit jets of particulate-laden fluids. Um, they, these fluids can be upwards of 700 degrees, or almost four times the boiling point of water. And the particles are typically very fine-grained and very sulfur, uh, sulfuric in nature. Um, the next one is actually going to be the white smokers. They're farther away from heat, so they're cooler, and they emit all sorts of sort of interesting things, metals like barium, calcium, and silicon, and these are all white. So they look very, very different. Um, and there are lots and lots of hydrothermal vents that we know of. You know, you can think of ones that are closer to the... Um, <clears throat> closer to land, such as those in the Mediterranean or the Red Sea, um, but most of them we know of are, exist in the Pacific Ocean, um, Indian Ocean, as well as along the coast, and as well as on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And so they're spread across, spread across the globe, but you'll notice is they are at the boundaries of the tectonic, tectonic plates, whereby our entire um, uh, land sits upon. But ultimately, the idea being that these deep sea vents have these magma that's really, really, really warm, 1200 degrees C, so uh, 12 times the boiling point of water, very, very hot. It essentially gets pushed up through these cracks that form at these tectonic plates, and it releases all sorts of different things. Um, and as it moves away from the smoker, it gets cooler and cooler and cooler until eventually it um, gets cool enough that it precipitates out and lands on the ocean. Um, and again, I just want to note that this really, really hot um, material, I'm sorry, this really, really hot material is emitting very, very cold ocean water. But as you can see, it has all sorts of really important things like magnesium, iron, manganese, methane, iron, all sorts of things that uh, hydrogen, hydrogen gas, uh, hydrogen sulfide, all sorts of things that microbes like to eat and they need for their metabolism. And as such, because of this, microbes have learned to live there. And so deep sea vents are the most diverse of all extreme habitats. Um, if you're going to live at a deep sea vent, you have to be a hypothermophile. 
Remember, these temperatures um, are very, very hot, you need, which means you need to grow close to the boiling point of water at about 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it is home to many, 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 many members of the bacteria, including actinobacteria, proteobacteria, and so on and so forth. Um, there are many archaea there as well. And there are many, many different lifestyles. So there's endosymbionts. Um, so as I mentioned before, there's these giant worms, and there's many bacteria that become symbionts of these giant worms. You can live in a bi as a biofilm on rocks and, and mats on the, the floor of the ocean, or you can live as a free planktonic cell. And the diversity of... <clears throat> of microbes does vary pretty substantially, but it is dominated by proteobacteria. But what you'll notice is that these are, these are um, essentially direct, taken directly at the vent. Um, uh, sort of uh, background samples, um, take samples taken at the vent, and then samples taking sort of like in the vent's plume away, sort of like you know a few meters away from the vent as it's starting to cool down. What you notice is that if you're living right near the vent, you're still dominated by proteobacteria, but it is a pretty diverse consortium of microorganisms. Um, one uh, group of organisms that we find at these vents um, is actually the epsilon proteobacteria. You don't find them very many places, um, but um, we will talk about them later. Um, um, we know epsilon proteobacteria. We're going to talk about Campylobacterium jejuni when we talk about uh, food microbiology. And we're also going to talk about Helicobacter pylori when we talk about the microbiome lecture. But many epsilon proteobacteria are, have been recovered from hydrothermal vents in cold seeps. Um, and so they are important for how these uh, deep sea vent communities actually function. Um, and the vast majority of organisms that live um, in these vents, in terms of the epsilon proteobacteria, are chemolithoautotrophic. So they oxidize sulfur or hydrogen, and they reduce nitrate or oxygen, and they do fix carbon as well. Um, as I mentioned, there are some really cool, <coughs> excuse me, uh, really cool symbioses that occur at these vents. And as with all ecosystems, microbes are extremely and critical to the food web structure in these systems. Um, as you mentioned, most vent microbes are chemolithoautotrophic. They use reduced compounds from the plume to fuel their metabolisms and fix carbon. Um, but at least one member of this family can actually glow from the black smoker for photosynthesis, um, which is actually pretty cool. <laughs> um, there are massive microbes that are grazed upon by amphipods, shrimp, and other crustaceans. And vent microbes can also contribute to the food web by acting as key endosymbionts. And so we have these giant tube worms. These were actually discovered from the Galapagos Rift in the Eastern Pacific Rise. This is what they look like. They don't look like very much, um, but uh, most things that live at the bottom of the ocean don't look like too much. But these, um, these organisms are interesting. They lack a mouth and a digestive systems, and they depend completely on the organic matter derived from their bacterial symbionts to give them food. And it's actually really, really uh, sort of a fascinating thing. Um, they have these red plumes which contain hemoglobin, um, and what ends up happening um, with this hemoglobin, which I'm sure you all know from your own blood, but hemoglobin does combine with hydrogen sulfide, CO2, and oxygen, and transfers it to um, sort of this, this white part, it's called the troposome, via its vascular system. But it is an organism, again, that is completely reliant on the microbes as a whole. The microbes are giving it carbon, the, the plants are, I'm sorry, the tube worms are giving the microbes some other things that they need, and there's this really interesting symbiosis that happens. And I, as I mentioned before, these tube worms can be upwards of six feet long. They are, they are absolutely incredible. Um, there are some other types of metabolisms that are important. <clears throat> At hydrothermal events, including methanotrophy, so they, they use methane as their only source of biomass and energy. Um, they can account for a substantial amount of vent microbial communities. Um, there's methane oxygenation and methanogenesis, which we've talked about before. As we've, there's also sulfur reduction and sulfur oxidation, again, two processes that we've talked about before. There's lots of uh, nitrogen cycling, and there's all sorts of metal reduction, including iron reduction, manganese reduction, and so, and so forth. 
um, sort of closely related to our vents is the deep subsurface. Um, and so microbes, you know, we think about sort of microbes living at the surface of things, but microbes have been found miles and miles down. Um, and so they can live very, very deep down in the Earth's crusts. Crust. Um, and as you go deeper and deeper in the Earth's crust, it gets much, much warmer and the pressure gets really, really high. Um, and we commonly see pretty dramatic changes in pH as well. And the question you can ask is, how do they survive this crazy area? Um, the answer is, go hide in a rock. <laughs> uh, and so we have groups of microorganisms called endoliths. Um, and this, so there's organisms that live inside rocks. And so if you live inside of a rock, you're typically autotrophic. You're feeding on, you're feeding on iron, potassium, and sulfur, or sometimes even radioactive decay. Um, but you can also feed upon other endoliths or other microbes that are living in rocks. Um, they have very, 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 very slow generation time, meaning it takes them 100 to 10,000 years for one generation to occur. So to go from one cell to two cells. Um, they can survive some pretty extreme conditions. Uh, they've been found at depths about two miles below ground. Um, it, it might exist deeper, but digging that deep down is very, very expensive. Um, you know, the deeper you go, the more expensive it is. Um, the more resources you need to physically deep dig deep that far, but they can probably be lower. Um, they're most likely limited by temperature. Um, <clears throat> and so most temperature resistant microbe that we know of tops at about 121 degrees, um, which would mean that at about a depth of 2.8 miles below the continental crust and about 4.6 miles below the ocean surface. So potentially they can go down pretty deep, upwards of three to five miles down. Um, they're really interesting to um, uh, astrobiologists because these endolithic environments potentially exist on other planets such as Mars or even Venus um, or any other planet that has a solid surface. So it is a particular interest to understanding how microbes might colonize extraterrestrial environments. And there's also a fun fact, there is a, um, a professor at Boston University uh, he's an emeritus professor called Stepiko Glubix, was actually on research on these endolithic fungi deep in the ocean. Um, and it was actually a really interesting sort of group. Um, that being said, there are some really interesting metabolisms that occur in these endoliths. So for interesting, um, these microbes were oftentimes rely on uranium decay, which generates hydrogen for them, which allows them to make hydrogen gas, which in turn allows them to metabolize. Uh, which is actually a really sort of interesting way to make your living as a microbe. And so we can actually physically look at some of these deep surface microbes. And you can see that, you know, they're, they're sort of buried in these rocks and they are, they're deep down and they're sort of embedded inside them, but they're forming a pretty um, cohesive unit working, um, living as well as likely working together in these environments. Um, <clears throat> Sort of um, moving on, we're going to talk about sort of a few uh, organism, or one organism and then a, 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 a couple of other extreme microbes before we sort of uh, end this part of the lecture. Um, so we're going to talk about um, chirococco, <laughs> I'm not even going to try. It's a primitive uh, cyanobacteria that is, is um, known for photosynthesizing and nitrogen fixing, and it is likely an ancestor of cyanobacteria. Um, they are known for their ability to survive harsh environmental conditions, including high and low temperatures, ionizing radiation, and very, very high salt. It's one of the interesting things about these microbes is they need very, very, very little light. So they can live in cracks and fissures of rocks. They can live under rocks that are translucent, i.e. E. like um, rocks that can allow the penetration of light. Um, and they're actually, one of the interesting things about these microbes is they're a possible candidate for potentially terraforming Mars to make Mars habitable for humans. The idea being we could seed Mars with these organisms and they could potentially transform the atmosphere in the, in the ecology of Mars prior to us colonizing them. So, fun facts. Um, other extreme microbes include Vibrio diabolicus, so it's a polysaccharide secreting bacteria. It was isolated from a deep sea vent polychaete. Um, and it's actually facultatively anaerobic, heterotrophic, as well as mesophilic. Um, the bacillus genus, so we've worked with bacillus multiple times in the, um, 
in the lab setting, but there are many type, many bacteria within this genus bacillus that can survive very high pH, high temperatures, high salt, or even high boron concentrations. This is actually a really new sort of thing we found. It, it was discovered, I believe, two years ago. Um, boron can get really high at, um, as you go deep down in the Earth's crust. And then uh, sort of one of the really cool microorganisms is Deinococcus radiodurans. It can survive extreme radiation. Um, it can survive um, 1,800 times the amount of radiation that an average human can survive. Human can survive. And so one, just one last thing before we sort of end this part of the lecture, um, and is uh, just some other environments to think about. These include hypersaline lakes like the Dead Sea, polar environments are, um, extreme environments, but there's also a type of environment called acid mine drainage. And so what ends up happening when you mine, uh, when you mine metals or anything out of the ocean, I'm sorry, out of uh, like the, out of the land, like, you know, think about gold or precious metals for cell phones or things like that. You, you ultimately um, create these really acidic um, draining systems. And uh, we actually recently discovered that these draining systems are actually teeming with microbial life and they metabolize the remaining and the leftover sulfur from mining. Um, and these are very, very acidic um, environments. And so they can, they, can th they can oftentimes be a pH of one, sometimes a pH of 0.5, or sometimes even a pH of zero. And so they, um, <clears throat> these really extreme environments that are actually pretty common around the planet, because mining is a really big thing on every continent. But uh, one of the things they do is they can make these drain waters deep um, yellow and orange because of their photosynthetic pigments. And then finally, we also have alkaline lakes, like Lake Mono, that has a very, very high pH. Anyways, so let's wrap up this final section. Uh, so the summary for this is extreme habitats are globally distributed and are defined by having one or more environmental parameter dis dis seemed uh, disqualifying from life. They're originally thought to be exclusively archaea, but now we know there's tons and tons of bacteria that do this. Um, these organisms contain very interesting and unique adaptations for these conditions, some of which help um, that actually help us and, um, and also help us think about exobiology. Um, so thinking about microbes on other planets or potentially us moving life to another planet. Um, as you probably noticed is that this type of microbiology was um, much more sort of, hey, here's all the cool things as opposed to the previous two, be simply because this is not a particularly well-funded area of microbiology. It's a relatively new area. Again, it was in the 90s that we really started looking at it relative to, say, the ocean and soil, which we've been studying for 50 plus years. Um, and it's also a really hard thing to study because it's hard to study really cold or really acidic, or it's really hard to study, you know, deep in the Earth's core or deep under, uh, deep underwater. So, um, I'm sure in the coming years, we'll see lots of crazy things coming from these extreme environments that will be really informative. So that's going to be the end of today's lecture. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, take care, everyone, and stay safe. Bye-bye.